Now we're going to talk about lever types in mechanical bench. You may have noticed if you look at somebody spinning like a figure skater that that never actually happens, thank goodness. But what does happen is when their arms or legs are more horizontal, they're slower. Uh, and then when they become more vertical, then they're faster. The torque is the same either way. What they do when they extend their arms or legs out more horizontally is that they give inertia a greater moment arm. So what is a lever, as we see with this drawing here on your right? A lever has three elements. Uh, it's a rigid body that can change the direction of force, and there's a trade-off between the distance uh, and the force frequently in most cases. Mechanical advantage is a way that we describe levers, and mechanical advantage is the ratio between the effort arm and the resistance arm. Uh, so I'll go ahead and show you what the different parts are with this drawing here. So the effort arm uh, is what is in between the fulcrum right here. In this case, it's a rock uh, and the distance between his hands, between the axis uh, and his hands. So that's the effort, the resistance arm is in between the fulcrum and what he's trying to move. So you see what this fellow has is he's got a long effort arm and a short resistance arm. So when he pushes down on his effort arm because it's longer, uh, he actually moves the end of the stick, a bigger arc of rotation, uh, but there's more force at the other end. Uh, so he has traded off displacement. He's putting in more displacement for force on the other side of the F resistance arm. Either way, the torque remains the same. We consider the human body as having three classes of levers. Uh, the class one lever is where the effort arm and resistance arm are equal. So there is no change in the force displacement relationship. We'll talk a little bit about that in more detail in the next slide. Or another example of that is that the axis of rotation is in between the effort arm and the resistance arm, kind of rare in the human body. The class two lever is where the effort arm is greater than the resistance arm, or the uh, ratio between effort arm over resistance arm is greater than one, and that increases force at the expense of displacement. And again, we'll show you some examples. But the, by far the most common uh, is the uh, class 3 lever, uh, and the class 3 lever increases displacement at the expense of force. Uh, so if our hands were right up at the deltoid tubercle, uh, then we'd be producing so much force at our hands that we'd be able to push over walls. It would be great, but then again, we would weigh 200 pounds and be 18 inches tall, so we'd look very funny. Uh, so what we have instead uh, are very high forces taking place way proximal to where the hand, for instance, actually is, but because our mechanical advantage is so bad, we don't get very much force at the actual end of the limb. The first class lever is where the mechanical advantage is either equal between the effort arm and the resistance arm, or uh, the fulcrum is in between the effort arm and the resistance arm. So there's both types of these variations of the class one lever in the human body. And in either case, the direction of the force is changed around the fulcrum. So an illustration of this would be a seesaw. And an example, and the most common example of this in the human body, is how the skull rests upon the atlas or the first cervical vertebra. Uh, so for example, as the neck extensors, uh, the muscles in the back of the neck, uh, pull down, it tilts the skull up. 
a class two lever is one that magnifies force, so it has a mechanical advantage of greater than one. A example of this is a wheelbarrow. So here, the axis of rotation is the axle of the wheelbarrow. Uh, the effort arm is the distance between that axle and the center of mass of the load that the guy is lifting. And the effort arm is from that same axle to the hands of the guy lifting from the handle. So he is lifting through a greater arc of rotation, but <clears throat> there is more force that he's able to lift with. An example of this in the human body is the foot rotating around the metatarsal heads as the foot lifts up with the body weight on top of it. So here is the axis of rotation, the metatarsal heads. The resistance arm is the distance between the metatarsal heads and the center of mass. Uh, and the effort arm is the distance between the metatarsal heads and the pull of the plantar flexors of the ankle. A class three lever is one that has a mechanical advantage of less than one. That is to say that it magnifies velocity and displacement at the expense of force. And it's by far the most common type of lever in the human body. A mechanical example of that is a guy with a shovel. So here you see uh, the the axis is here at its back end. Uh, the um, effort arm is here at between the axis, which is his back hand, and his front hand. But the resistance arm is between the axis, which is his back hand, uh, and the load in the shovel, which is over here. So you see that the effort arm is in between the resistance arm and the axis. In the human body, as I said, this is by far the most common type of levers that muscles make with joints. Uh, and an example is the bicep. So the axis is the sagittal plane axis of the elbow joint, as you see here. Uh, the effort arm is the distance between that axis and the point of attachment of the biceps. And then the effort arm is the distance between the axis of the elbow uh, and the center of mass of the forearm and hand. How much torque a muscle is able to move a limb segment around its axis of rotation is a factor of its moment arm. How much torque is being applied to a limb segment by gravity or other external forces is also a factor of moment arm. How much of the force being generated by the muscle is being applied to the bone that it's moving is a factor of its angle of application. We're going to talk about all those things over the next few minutes. Here we see an example of the muscular moment arm of the biceps. So the moment arm is the distance between the axis of rotation of the elbow and the point on the radius where the biceps attaches. Uh, now, just to make things harder for you, the moment arm will actually change according to joint angle, and we'll describe how this works over the next several minutes. The muscular moment arm is measured from how much of the muscular pull is perpendicular to the lever, in this case, the bone. And remember that usually mus muscle attachments are not perpendicular to the bone. Even if they are at a particular joint angle, that joint angle will vary depending upon the point in the range of motion, and therefore the muscular moment arm will also vary depending upon the point in the range of motion. So given a constant force of contraction, which you actually do not have, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about muscles, the torque is the greatest at the point in the range of motion where the muscular moment arm is the longest. Uh, in other words, when the force is applied at 90, 90 degrees perpendicular to the lever, that is when all the force of the muscle is being 
contributed to the rotation of the joint. Now remember also that the angle of application of force is not the same as the joint angle. The angle of application is the angle at which the tendon inserts into the bone. What you see here is kind of a schematic description of moment arm. So over on example A, you see the muscular moment arm is quite short from the axis of rotation uh, to the pull of the muscle. Uh, and as we go to B and C, the point upon which the muscle attaches onto the bone has not changed. But because the limb segments are becoming more perpendicular, uh, the moment arm is also longest at that point where the angle between the pull of the muscle and the axis of rotation is 90 degrees. However, uh, if we continue to flex, this is a schematic, looks like an elbow. If we continue to flex, you see that the moment arm again gets shorter. If you remember the example of the knee in the runner and the static equilibrium equation that we did together with the last lecture, uh, you perhaps remember that the joint compressive forces are gigantic. Uh, and we're going to start to discuss why that is on this slide here. So the action line of most muscles is usually much more parallel to the limb segment than it is perpendicular. Uh, and the rotary component, that is the amount of muscle force that's actually moving the muscle, is rarely larger than the translatory component, which is usually compressive. That translatory component uh, contributes to joint compression and occasionally joint distraction. Uh, so as we had calculated last time, uh, those joint compressive forces can get huge, and they really can get huge, but luckily for us, joint surfaces actually thrive on high compressive forces as long as they are applied cyclically. That is a principle that you'll probably be seeing in your sleep after the next couple classes that you guys have with me. This is how angle of application works. In this example, we see the biceps pulling on the radius of the forearm. Uh, in example A, the forearm is almost perpendicular to the pull or the vector of the biceps. So most of the force being generated by the biceps is compressive. You can see that the angle of application is very small. And I'll show you what that angle of application is. Here is that angle of application. Uh, as the forearm and the radius becomes more perpendicular, then the angle of application gets better. And the proportion of the biceps pull, which is rotary, uh, is increasing. The proportion of the biceps pull, which is stabilizing, is decreasing. There is R for rotary, and here is the stabilizing component. And as you see on the next diagram, the more perpendicular the forearm in the radius gets, the greater the proportion of rotary force is being generated by the biceps and the smaller the proportion of stabilizing force. Here we see the same diagram continued. The radius is getting almost perpendicular. The amount of rotary force is getting very great. The amount of stabilizing force is getting small. And then finally, when the vector of the biceps is absolutely perpendicular to the forearm and the radius, such as we see here, this is where the moment arm is longest. When the angle proceeds past 90, or it's becoming less perpendicular again, then we actually begin to get a little bit of distractive force. Uh, and the amount of rotary force is actually going down a so you see the angle of application is a little smaller uh, in example F than it is in example E. Now we're going to go from the internal forces and torques to thinking about the external torques. Those are the torques that are being generated by mainly gravity or forces that are outside of the body. So what we see here on this schematic diagram 
uh, is how the more horizontal, and the horizontal is really the important thing, because when things are horizontal, then they are perpendicular to the force of gravity. Uh, so here in the first diagram, you see that the axis of rotation, which would be probably an elbow joint, uh, is over here. Uh, and then the moment arm is from the axis of rotation uh, to the center of mass, which is here. Okay, and the more horizontal, uh, which in this case is also perpendicular, but the moment arm of gravity has not to do with the joint angle. It has to do with how horizontal the limb segment is to gravity. The more horizontal it gets, the more the moment arm of gravity increases. So the moment arm of gravity is greatest when the limb segment is at its most horizontal. Uh, and in the final diagram, the uh, elbow, the schematic elbow, is flexing. Uh, and so the moment arm of gravity has actually gone shorter than it is than when the limb segment is at its most horizontal. This series of drawings is meant to illustrate what happens uh, with an increasing moment arm of gravity. So the drawing over all the way on the left is representing a very young man. And you see the center of mass actually even going from his head is going straight down through his trunk to his feet. So the moment arm of gravity, uh, which is an external moment arm of trunk flexion, this will be clear in just a second, is not very great. However, as the man gets very old, you see that the center of mass is way forward of the axis of rotation, in this case, the axis of rotation of the trunk. So he has developed now a very large external moment arm of trunk flexion, which is exactly what he does not need for several reasons, which we'll think about over the course of the semester. Let us think about how muscles can generate the joint torque, which allows us to get the force to where we Muscles are able to generate the highest internal moment under the following conditions. Remember, internal moment means that the factors moving the joint are internal to the joint itself, mainly muscles. So, of course, when the magnitude of internal force are higher, when the muscles are bigger or able to generate more force, then you're going to have a greater joint torque. Uh, also, when the force is more perpendicular to the joint segment lever. So a real good example of this is the plantar flexors moving the foot around the talocrural joint. Uh, the force generated by the plantar flexors is almost perpendicular uh, to the moment arm of the foot. But with the knee, for example, uh, we see that the force of the quadriceps is mainly parallel uh, to the tibia. Our skeletal structure has given us some tools to help improve the amount of torque that muscles are able to generate. One of them are anatomical pulleys. So anatomical pulleys can change the direction of force, thereby making the angle of application more perpendicular and more efficient at getting force to the bone that they're moving and generating more torque, and also increasing the moment arm. So an example of that is the patella. So over on the right side, you see an example of what a knee joint would look like without a patella. And this actually is done sometimes when people have like highly comminuted fractures of the patella. It's called a patellectomy, and then the knee has to work without a patella. But what the patella works like is the strut on this crane that you see over here. So the strut on the crane uh, allows a better angle of application to the cable that's pulling over this pulley. 
and in the same way, uh, the patella allows a better angle of application. So instead of having such a perpendicular angle, uh, such as you see without the patella, you have a more perpendicular angle. I'll show that to you here. So that would be the component of, or the rotary component uh, of the quadriceps, and also you have a longer moment arm of the patella, patella uh, thereby allowing the quadriceps to produce a greater torque for the knee.